Big Tin Can is the world's leading sales learning and enablement platform that delivers the onboarding and training, preparation, coaching, customer engagement, and follow-up and insights that modern businesses need to win. Welcome to the Sales Influence Podcast, where we talk about finding the why and how people buy. I'm your host, Victor Antonio. Thank you for joining me. Thank you for lending me those ears. And if you're watching this on video, thank you for lending me those beautiful eyeballs. Today, I have the one and only Mr. Vito himself, Tony Perinello. Welcome to the Sales Influence Podcast, Tony. How you doing? Yeah, I'm doing fine. Thanks for having me. Thanks for inviting me to be on. So, so, Tony, I know who you are, but give these folks your 30-second, one-minute pitch of who you are, and don't be afraid to sell yourself, okay? <laughs> Thanks for that. So, you know, geez, I don't know. Right after the earth cooled, I started selling, and I started selling computers for Hewlett Packard. And this is back in the day when you sold hardware, and then they had to figure out how to plug software into the thing to make it work. And so I learned how to sell um, against big, big you know, IBM and and all the big guys and gals that were selling computers at the time. So, you know, HP grew up as an instrumentation company. I grew up as a salesperson at HP and I, and I had an interesting nine years at HP. Um, First four years, I won every award, rookie of the year, million dollar club. It goes on and on and on. I knocked it out of the park for four years on there. My fifth year of sales, I leaned back a little bit, you know, I thought, Hey, I could, I could live on, I could make my quarter on add on business for my existing accounts. I stopped prospecting. I stopped doing the one thing that made me a massive success in the first couple of years at HP. So I'm halfway through the year, 19% of quota, I get put on probation. Six months to get on my number or find another place to work. So I had to figure out a different way to sell at HP. And and what I figured out, and, and I and look back at the last four years, who, were, who I was selling to, how long it told, to, to, took me to sell stuff. And I thought, man, I'm going to go to the top dog or poodle, and I'm going to I'm going to make my pitch and I'm going to qualify the account and I'm either going to walk out the door with an intent or I'm going to walk out the door and and get to the next prospect as soon as I can. And lo and behold, in six months, I went from, you know, less than 20 percent of quota to 106 percent of quota. And I'll never forget the awards banquet that year. And I, and I, and they said my, they said my name, Tony Paranello, you know, and I go running up to get my little trophy and I sat back down and the VP of sales comes up and taps me on the shoulder. He says, Hey, I want to know two things from you. Number one, are all these orders going to unbook after the first of the year? And number two, what the heck did you do? Because <laughs> and what I did is I made one simple shift. Wait, 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 I'm sorry. Repeat, repeat the second, repeat the second one again. I'm sorry. So, so the first one was, are all these orders going to unbook after the first of the year? Second one, what the hell did you do? Because we didn't think you had a shot at making it. And so what I did is I started my sale where it was eventually going to end up. I started at the end of the approver signing or giving the approval to sign the purchase order for the computer system. And that person turned out to be Vito, the very important top officer or the person with the ultimate veto power. And so when I left HP and started my own company, I said, I'm going to start selling to Vito. And so I put this whole giddy up together. And I'm, it's, this was, uh, geez, I don't know, I've been at it for 35 years. Selling to Vito. Yeah, I mean, and it, and yeah. it sticks. It's that's like a, that's white amazing. on rice, man, because I'll go back and I hear from people I taught, you know, 30 years ago. Say, so, you know, I remember that course you told me that veto stuff, you know, and so, yeah, so, so I took something that, that seemed almost impossible to do, and I put a process together on how to do it, no matter what your style is, no matter what you're selling, no matter what market, but other than government sales, I mean, if you look at business to business in the complex sales environment, um, veto works and it has worked for the last number of years and, and I continue to make it better and better and better and improve upon it. So, so my giddy up, my giddy up is that I help salespeople get those hard to reach people, have an appointment with them and sell to them, start their sale at the top. And when you do that, amazing things happen. Like the size of your sale grows because people at the top don't have a budget. You know, they, what do you need? I want that, I'll get it. And they, don't, they don't have a budget. So your sales size grows and your sales cycle shrinks. And that magic equation busts your quota. And it's, it, it's, when you think about it, it's simple. It's not easy to do, but it's a simple concept. Yeah. 
and I teach them either how to write the letter, I, I, I email, love that. all that kind of stuff. It's, it's a, a, a to Z, much like the stuff you teach has a very practical, tactical approach, you know, and that's how I've made my living. Yeah. Well done, Matt. The, I wanted to ask you, let's, let, let's dig into some of this because I think it's interesting because I think you have this, you can look back and you have this historical perspective on how selling has changed over the yeah. years. Uh, let me begin with this question. I think the, the first question would be, when we look at selling to veto, very important top officers, people who actually make the buying decision, you know, what have been the, some of the changes and some of the adjustments you've had to make you know, in your course or as you're training people on this? What are some of the changes you've had to make? Let, let, let's start with this. What changes haven't I had to make? Let's start with that first. If you think about it now for a moment, think about this, <laughs> this president, this CEO, this owner of the company sitting in their office today. What are they thinking about? What's on their to-do list? And if you're too lazy or don't have the time to do the research, to go to their website, to have industry, just, just say, look, I'm going to shoot uh, with, with these four bullets in my gun, I'm going to, I'm going to approach Vito with, with these four ideas. And if I can't touch on these four ideas, you're working for the wrong company. You're selling the wrong stuff. So number one, all Vitos care about revenue, increasing revenue, whether that's new business revenue and new markets that they haven't explored yet, or add on business, high margin, add on business from existing customers. So increasing revenue. Second is cutting or controlling cost, moving from unpredictable cost environments to very predictable, forecastable cost environments. That's number two. Number three, increasing the efficiencies and effectiveness of anything or everything or anyone or everyone in their company. And number four, mitigating risk, making smarter decisions. Now, the order of those items change, but they all add up to increase shareholder and stakeholder value, period. Those are the four areas that every veto in the free world, outside of government, <laughs> commercial, business to business and enterprises care about. So think about this veto sitting there looking up at the ceiling tiles, just wishing they would have someone contact them with an idea they haven't thought about or haven't fully explored on how to do at least two of those four items on their to-do list. I don't, didn't mean to interrupt, but I mean, you highlight something that a lot of people, the majority of people don't highlight, and that is mitigating risk. I mean, we've heard yes. increased revenue, reduce costs, improve efficiencies, you know, uh, tangible things, people, whatever it may be. But talk to me a little bit about what you mean by helping them mitigate risk. So, so Vito's have trusted advisors on their team, right? Hand-picked individuals that report to them. They want these individuals to make smarter, faster, more accurate decisions, period, on every, in, in every step they take in their day. So maybe this isn't for Vito, but it's for their trusted advisors. Um, because Vito's think they know everything, you know, and know how to do everything. And so most of this stuff, most of these conversations you'll have with these individuals, they're going to send you to somebody to do whatever it is you're talking about doing, which is the beauty of starting at the top of an organization. I mean, imagine this. Most salespeople are not calling presidents, CEOs, and owners, or other privileged C-titles executives. They're just not doing it. They come up with all sorts of excuses. They're, they're busy. They won't take my call. I don't know what to talk to them about, blah, 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 blah. Well, here's the thing. Let's just say my target, my perfect person to sell to in an organization. Now, let's just say, I'll just, maybe it's the, um, the CMO, the chief marketing officer. Who does the CMO report to? Typically, they report to the president, the CEO, or the owner. Well, imagine the CMO getting a note from the president this morning to talk to me. You think they'd talk to me? Sure they would. I think they would. I think that, it, well, if they don't, it's like a career-limiting mistake for them because if they bump into the president, the president says, hey, did you talk to that guy, Tony Paranello? No, I haven't gotten around to it. What do you mean you haven't got? So, so getting sent to the person you really want to do your sales cycle with, keeping Vito involved at all times, that's, that's, a, that's a given. But you start at the top, you make sense to that person, they're going to send you to the people they trust the most to do whatever you're talking about doing. And so it's a lay down. I mean, it, it, 
get in line with everyone else trying to get the CMO's attention or get to someone who will send it to the person with the grace of God. And so that the simple shit gotcha. there. But how do you, how do you, you again, when we talk about, let's, let's bring it back to mitigating yes. risk. Tie that to mitigating risk. Yeah. So let's just say you sell software. The worst thing you could tell a CEO of a company is that you have a piece of software that will help them mitigate risk. They have soft, they have so much software they've invested. So they hate software and people who sell software. So stop think, thinking about what it is and discuss what it does. So what does your software help do? D does it help them uh, do research faster, uh, do calculations faster, uh, do all, anything with regards to making faster decisions smarter? Whatever that is, you bundle it into what that means to veto. So what does it mean to veto? Uh, being in compliance, let's talk about that for a moment. If you're out of compliance, the fees and risk and personal risk these days, the personal risk of a president, CEO, or owner, or any board member, and we'll get to board members in a minute because you want to talk about a lay down, board members are a real lay down. So, so if, if they are out of compliance, they're personally liable in many states and in many countries around the world. So we're talking about personal liability. And so focus on what it does, not what it is. I like that. I, I wanted to ask you something about, um, and we'll still get back to the evolution of sales and what's changed, but but I want to I want to tackle this one issue because I think it's it's going to be top of mind to people listening, and that is uh, imposter syndrome. I don't know if I should be calling vetoes. How do you help people overcome that imposter syndrome? Uh, you know, <laughs> the longer someone has been selling the worse this is. It's like a chronic illness. And somewhere along the line, someone has taught salespeople that they don't have the right to do this. So, so let's, man, we, we could probably spend a lifetime trying to teach people how to get past this block they put in their own head. But you're a great storyteller. Let me tell you just a quick story about this. Is that okay? All right, so I'm on, prob yeah, well, I'm on probation. I have to sell a lot of stuff and I have to sell it, sell it quickly. So there's a university in my territory. Um, and I got the buzz that the university is looking to upgrade their UNIVAC computer system. So what do I do? I book an appointment with the Dean of schools at this university, the Dean. Now, after I booked the appointment, I thought, what the heck did I just do? I don't have a college credit to my name. I've never been, I've never sat in a college, uh, at a university, I've never been to college. I'm gonna go call the dean of a university? What am I thinking? This is the stupidest thing. The morning, I, I put this in my brain, as I'm gonna walk into this office, I'm gonna see, you know, diplomas and all this kind of stuff, and what, what am I gonna talk about? I freaked out, man. I totally freaked out. On the morning of the appointment, I was so sick, I had a stomach ache got the jitters, I push through, I go to the university, I'm walking on the campus, I'm saying, this is the stupidest thing I've ever done, what am I gonna talk about? This guy's got diplomas and I've never been on a campus, you know, blah, 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 I'm doing all this negative self-talk. I walk into the inner sanctum, the receptionist and his personal secretary brings me in his office and lo and behold, my fears have come true. There's decorations and diplomas all over the place. I'm sitting there and I start to get up to leave. I got to get out of here, man. And so as I'm leaving, in walks the dean of schools. And he, he hands out, he pulls his hand out. Like, I shake his hand and I said, I was just getting ready to leave. I'm so nervous. I'm sitting here. I, I booked this. I, I did the whole thing. I says, I, I've never been to, to a university. I've never had a college course. He says, stop it, stop it, stop it, sit down. He says, sit down. And I, I sit down and I'm just sweating. And he says, you know what? I almost canceled the appointment with you today because I'm nervous about meeting with a sales a person that sells computers because I don't know anything about computers. And at that moment, at that moment, I figured, oh my God, here's the dean of schools, doesn't know what I know about computers. And I was nervous about meeting him. I'm walking. So that lesson right there stuck in my brain that says, you know what? Hewlett Packard, this great company, 
has given me the right, all the research they've done, all the products they've done, their history and everything, they've given me the right to, to do this, to reach out to people and tell the story. And so that was the major shift. And so it's like an epiphany to me. My God, I have something to offer people with a lofty title, with a lofty background, with whatever. And so at that, that moment, that was the major shift in my life. So everybody listening, if you think about this, if you have one idea, just one, on how to help a veto overcome any obstacle they have in their business with, and go back to those four things we talked about, the revenue, the cost, the efficiencies, and effectiveness, and mitigating risk, just one idea, you have what I call equal business stature. Doesn't mean you have equal business title, because if equal business title meant anything to anybody, salespeople wouldn't sell to anybody but other salespeople. And so you got to punch through that. And I wish I knew the answer, the real answer to the question you asked, but I think it's different for everybody, but I know what it was for me. And that's figuring out that I had equal business stature with any title in any company, including board members and the madame of the board, the chairman of the board. It doesn't matter. Yeah. I don't know if that helps. Tony, that has got to be, that has got to be the best answer I've ever heard to that question. Like, you know that. Well, that's like the best answer I've ever heard, man. I now have a new phrase in my head, equal business stature, not equal business title. Because you're right, Tony. I mean, I, I love your story. And I'm literally, man, it's the best, best explanation I've ever heard through a story. Because too often we're focused on the person's title yes. without appreciating what we know. Yes, that's exactly and I right. I love your story, man. Now, let's talk about what we know. Here's the problem about what we know. We've Our product training and our sales training that we get in companies like at Hewlett Packard was six months long. I mean, they teach you the bits and the bytes and the pieces and the parts and the components and everything you sold. And so you become this technologist. Well, guess what? Vitos don't understand this stuff. And across the board, what we need to do is we need to stop speaking F words to Vitos. Facts features and functions that are unfamiliar to them. When you get on the phone or you write a letter, and I don't yeah. care how you're approaching videos, smoke signals from a distant mountaintop, it doesn't matter the modality of approach. <laughs> but what matters, what really matters is no F words. You use one F word with a veto and they're gonna dismiss you. Oh, whoa, whoa, wait a minute, You know, I, I don't have time for this. Let me get you someone who can help you. You challenge their ego, their power, their control and authority. That's the first thing. Don't do that. Take, if you have a hard time with this, as most salespeople talk about what it is, not what it does, get a rubber band, put it around your wrist. Every time you use an F word, a fact, feature or function that comes right off your data sheets or right out of your product mm -hmm. training, take the rubber band, pull it out about four inches and let it go. I, I, I want to pause, just slow down a little bit, because you said something interesting. It's so good that you just zip right over it. But I'm like, wait a minute, there's some good behavioral stuff here. When you talked about, you know, the F words, right? Facts, features, and functions. You said something very subtle, but it's powerful. You said, because it challenges their ego, power, or authority, right. and they don't like That's that. Right. Just expand that on a little bit. I've never heard anybody say that. And so I kind of get it, but I want to make sure I got okay. it. So. Give me a little let's, more on that. Let's think about back to Vito now, the, the personality style of a Vito. As a matter of fact, what you'll find out about Vito is that 85% of them in America, 85% used to be salespeople like us. They used to be salespeople, so they love salespeople. They know nothing happens until something's sold, right? They know the essence of sales in their, organiza in their organization. But here's the rub. You have big egos. Power, control, and authority is very important to them. So using an F word takes them out of their comfort zone and they don't want to be out of their comfort zone because they think they know everything. Like we never say to a veto, did you know? Of course they don't. As you know, these little shifts that we make in what we say will either get us the equal business stature or get us dismissed. The other, the other area we need to talk about is the, the ego power control and authority by asking veto for an appointment, you're challenging their ego, power, control, and authority. What do they do all day long? They tell people what to do. They don't like being told what to do. They want to tell you what to do. So whenever you want to get an appointment with Vito, you just ask them, what do you want to see me do next? 
what's the best way for me and my team to discover if we can do what we're talking about doing for your organization? Tell me what to do next. They love to tell people what to do. So you play into that big ego, power, control, and authority. Never ask a veto a question that they... That's beautiful. I mean... But it speaks... I, I just want, I just want to yeah. highlight this because... Uh, Cause I, I know you'll keep going. I know you'll keep going, Tony, but slow down, slow down. It's good stuff, man. It's good stuff. It's, I don't usually slow people down, but your stuff is good stuff, man. So hold on. So uh, I like the, just that subtle shift from, did you know, to, as you know, did you know, you question authority, right? As you know, you're almost like, yeah, I know you know this, but I'm just saying, it, even if they don't know it, right? Right. And then the second part about never asking for the next speedy, ask them what the next best step is. What do you suggest? And right. these are subtleties that, you know, over time we learn and we do them automatically, like I know you do, but a lot of people listening to this go, are going, huh, I never thought such subtle shifts. And it probably never even thought about the ego power authority dynamic that yes. you're pointing out. So I, I yes. love that. So, so thank you for that. The, thank you for that I, compliment. I appreciate it. Um, so, so here again, <laughs> when I was a kid, there used to be this little game that Mr. Potato Head, you actually took a potato, right? And you stuck the eyeballs in I know what it is. I know what it is, Tony. All that kind of stuff. So when you build this persona of a Vito, think about Vito's office, right? And think about how they run their business. And, and think about their personality styles. Like they're, deci they're decisive. They love to make decisions. They love it. They know when they make a decision, something's going to happen. If they make a wrong decision... They might blame it on someone else and make another decision, but they're not shy about making decisions. And if Vito sees something that they want, that they understand, I don't, they don't care what it costs. They don't care what it costs. They care what it can do for them in ROI. If there's one, if there's one discussion that every salesperson in the world should understand, it's how to have an ROI conversation with Vito. And, and the way to start this conversation, think about this, Vito, what are your personal expectations when it comes to return on investment? What do you look for when you look at something that, that speaks to return on Understand how Vito thinks about return on investment, what their expectation is. Because if I know personally that I can deliver a 300% return on investment, Showing up in Vito's office saying that is probably the, one of the biggest mistakes you'll make without understanding what Vito's personal expectations are. Because if you knew that first, if you ask Vito that question, say, before, before we end our, our time today, let me ask you, what's your personal expectation of me, my organization, and the return on investment we could deliver to you? And if Vito looks in the eyeballs, you're talking to them on the phone, you know, we don't buy anything around here. We're not going to invest this kind of money. And by the way, you should always tell Vito what the investment's going to be, right? And do a ballpark. But Vito says, do you know, we don't touch anything that doesn't give us a 200% return on investment in the 12 month, 12, first 12 months. Well, how does 300% sound in six months? You're in. You earned your equal business budget. That's right. These are Yanked qualifying questions that you could ask a Vito on your first sales call with them because they love questions that make sense to them and that take them further along the trail, the trail of getting whatever it is you've been talking about getting for them. So don't be shy about asking Vito if they have $3 million to invest and what they, we've been talking about uh, doing here. Don't be shy about saying that. But you can't ask those questions of everyone else because they're all, oh, we can have it. We got to get the budget for that or that's too much money or whatever. Anytime you ask anybody to spend any amount of money that they either don't have in their personal portfolio or they've never spent in their life before, they're, they're going to back down from it. You know, and, and I, I have two characters that I talk about. Vito's one of them, a very important top officer, person with the ultimate veto power over everything in the organization. The other person is Seymour. Seymour lives in a place called Linoleumville, okay? If you're on a sales call and you're sitting or standing on linoleum, you're not with Vito. You're with Seymour. And Seymour's always loved to see more stuff, presentations, proposals, data sheets, quotations, whatever it is. It goes on and on and on. So think about that. Think about that. In the last 30 days, sales folks, 
Have you been standing on linoleum or rolling around on linoleum? Or have you been on thick, beautiful carpet or Italian imported, I, you know, tile? Yeah. Never, never thought about that. What, what, what I like about, you know, it, again, I think you're the first person I've had on my podcast. That's almost 400. <laughs> that's really talked about the psychology of dealing with the veto. But you're doing it in a different way, Tony. And this is what I appreciate. I'm highlighting this so, I can, so people can appreciate this. Is that you're, you're giving the person the, the respect so they can maintain their authority, you know, yes. and power and control, right? Yes, but at the exactly. same time, But at the same time, you're doing it in such a way where you're still guiding and controlling the conversation. Well, I'd like to use instead of controlling, I'm influencing the outcome of my first interaction with Vito. I'm not going to control it because Vito's a control freaks. So I'm influencing by asking the right questions and listening intently on the grunts and the groans and the emotion and anything else they're saying. We need to be expert listeners. And most of us are not. Most of us have not even read a book on how to listen, let alone be an expert listener. And so the conversation you're having is critical and they happen very quickly, very quickly. Um, and, and, and let's just think about the word I. Doesn't belong in your vocabulary when you're talking to Vito. I wanted to know, I'm interested in, I have. Forget yourself. We, you could use we, we could use our, but Vito, what's, in, what's in most important to you? Vito, here's another one that is a classic, classic way to frame and start building your, your, your equal business stature. Vito, where in your organization do you want to see the biggest improvement in the shortest period of time? Think about that question. If all Great you question. do, if Great all question. you do is blurt that out of your mouth and find out where Vito wants to see the biggest improvement in the shortest period of time. And if you can't help them do that, if you don't know someone else who could help them do that, Bid them a good day and take a hike. Because no matter who else you call in the organization, when it, when it comes to the, the approval, they're not going to buy it. They're just not going to buy it. Yeah. So forget I. I wanted to get back to the ROI. I wanted to get back to the ROI. And, and I want to ask you. Yeah. The I know the vetoes want to see ROI, right? Yes. And based on the questions you've asked already, right? Uh, by the way, your, and by the way, your point is well taken. Controlling is too hard of a word, more like influencing or guiding the conversation. Yes. So point taken. So when we look at ROI, you know, different studies show that sometimes ROI doesn't work. Sometimes right. it does. And I think it's context based. So yes. I'm going to make a statement and then you, you can correct me. Vito wants to see ROI or at least understand what the ROI is. When you get to mid manager level, the 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 need for that it might still be there to justify a project to move forward. But when you're dealing with frontline people, they don't care about ROI. You know, it's, it's as you move up, ROI becomes more of a thing we need to look at. Yeah. How would you rephrase that or reframe my thinking? For, well, for Vito's, I wouldn't reframe your thinking at all because it's, it's spot on. They have an expectation of ROI. ROI means different things to different people. You know, for mid managers, it might mean something else. So maybe it's not ROI, but it's, it's how to better improve the customer experience they're having or retain a top employees or whatever. So ROI means different things to different people. So I would, I would, I would always invite the question, what does return on investment mean to you? Yeah. What does return on investment mean to you? What is your definition of return on investment? Please tell me. Yeah. Educate me. Help me understand rather than making the assumption. For some vetoes, ROI is a tax problem, you know, and they don't want a tax problem. This year, they're taking every bit of revenue and they're distributing out, you know, 95% of it to their shareholders. So they're not working. So you got to find out what's important to them. You know, be more of an... I, by the way, I get, I get, I get I'm going to pause you because it's like, it's so good again. And again, I'm slowing you down because my my, my listeners want to keep up with you because it's good content. Yeah. What you've just done is interesting because you've reframed what ROI is. Yes. By simply asking the customer, what is your definition of ROI? Yes. And I, you know, I want to, again, just, I wanted to punctuate that because yes. you're cruising very quickly here. Are you from the East Coast, by the way, Tony? Are you an East Coaster? Oh, oh, Hoboken, New Jersey. Okay, that's... <laughs> I figured. That's so you like you're like clipping along. And I'm is that, is that I'm, I'm trying to slow you down because 
Yeah, I'm just trying to slow you down so you can just, I, like, really people can marinate in the stuff that you're saying. But I think that's interesting because when you ask a mid-manager what's your definition of ROI, it could be, as you said, customer satisfaction score, customer experience scores, NPS, net, you know, net pr uh, promoter score, whatever it may be. And so right. I, I love that, and I think that that's a very powerful statement. And I, I was sorry to cut off your flow, but it was so good. I just wanted no, to no, emphasize no. that. I love that. No, 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 that's fine. That, that's, that's perfect. Actually, um, we're saying ROI, but I always would invite salespeople to, to not use acronyms. I would say return on investment, return on investment. When Vito says ROI, then you can start saying ROI, return on investment, because that wor those words mean different things to different people. So ROI, I would say, uh, and, and drop all acronyms, by the way, whenever you communicate with Vito, you know, buzzwords, technology, blah, blah, blah drop all that. Those are in the F word category. Um, the other point I wanted to make Oh, um, I, I firmly believe through my experience, and, and, and here's the thing about me. When I stop using what I teach, I'm going to stop teaching it. So I'm still in the game, you know, and, and, and so I'm never going to be one of, one of the, a, a trainer, a sales trainer that just tells people to do stuff that they haven't done before. I, I, I perfect it myself before I recommend anybody in, in, in my following to do something. So that's my promise to everybody. I'm not going to tell you to do something that I don't do myself and, and it, that doesn't work. I'm mean, going to tell you the stuff that does work, lots of stuff that doesn't work. Um, but, but the other point I want to make about uh, salespeople as, as we, we tend to think that we need to do some type of introduction, uh, some type of icebreaker or something when, when we meet people. Um, to, to reduce the tension, you know, to get, get the tension down. It's like, who's tense? Who's the salesperson's the tense one. So icebreakers are for ships, not salespeople. Don't do this stuff. Just get to the point, stay on point. If you want to use an icebreaker with a veto, that, that's, and let's go back to the day when we actually made in-person sales calls, which was a lot of fun. And now that's starting to come back, thank God. And so let's say you're having this in-person sales call with a veto. And you walk into their office and you see that, sh that boat behind me there that, that's on the wall. You don't walk into Vito's office and say right out of the kitchen, that's a beautiful model there. Do, are you a sailor? Do you sail? No, don't do that. Get to the point, stay on point. You got five minutes, 10 minutes with the Vito. Get to the point, stay on point. On your way out the door, when you're walking out there, you stop. You turn and look at the boat on the wall. You say, the next time we get together, you got to tell me about that beautiful model that's on your wall. Vito's going to say, why wait till the next time? Let me tell you now, I own a 65-foot sloop and we... You're going to end your first meeting by just doing, turning things around. Instead of using ice break in the bean, use it at the end. If there's nothing on the wall, if it's stark, Vito's a minimalist. When you're walking out the door, next time we get together, next time we have a phone call, you got to take a moment and tell me how you became the CEO of this company. Hey, why wait till then? I'll tell you now. What you're doing is you're ending your first interaction with Vito on a high emotional note. It's called anchoring. You know this better than anyone. You're anchoring yourself to whatever you just said, whether it was the ship on the wall or the story about how they became a CEO. And I will guarantee you, the next time you reach out to Vito, they will take your call because you ended it on that high emotional note. So put that one in the bank. And never use an icebreaker when you walk into someone's room or when you get on the phone with someone, you know? That's like saying to someone, you get them on the phone, is this a good time? <laughs> if it wasn't a good time, I wouldn't have picked up the phone. Big Ten Can is the world's leading sales learning and enablement platform that delivers the onboarding and training, preparation, coaching, customer engagement, and follow-up and insights that modern businesses need to win. So talk to me a little bit more, Tony, about you know, ending on an emotional high, because I've never heard anybody really spell it out that way. You're the first person I've heard say, this is what you need to do. Reverse the strategy. Yeah. You know, I guess I'm a great flip-flopper. You know, I, I look at things and I say, wait a minute, why are we doing that at the beginning of a meeting, like an icebreaker that takes some time? And 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 if you run out of time with a veto, you're not, you may not get back in. And so so the icebreaker thing, reducing tension, who's tense, we're tense, they're not. You know, that's a joke. Don't do that. Get right to the point. Stay on point. Now, if you do it at the end, 
I mean, think about this. We love, Vito's love to talk. They love to talk. As a matter of fact, most of them are really great talkers and lousy listeners, all right? And so to get them to talk about themselves, their team, and their company is critical to building rapport with them. And so if you end your first interaction, whether it's on the phone or in person or on a video kind of thing, asking them a somewhat personal question, not too personal, someone that ties into what you've been talking about. And you saw something in their office or on their desk. They said something during your interaction with them. Bring them back to that. Ending your first interaction on that personal high and, and having that kind of connection with them is going to go a long way to you getting the second appointment. And I wrote a whole book about this, getting the second appointment with Vito. You know, it's like getting the first appointment is one thing, but being invited back in it's really going to depend upon what you did on the first meeting. It's kind of like dating. As a matter of fact, that book, Getting the Second Appointment with Vito, I, I started thinking about my dating experiences, and I'm like the first date king. I can get a first date with almost anybody, but getting the second date was more difficult. And I come to find out <laughs> in my dating experience is that the reason I wasn't getting a second date is I wasn't doing a good job on the first date. And so that applies to sales as well, especially when you're selling to Vito. So think about what you're doing on that first interaction, whether it's an email, an invite on LinkedIn, what, whatever modality you choose. Think about the impression you're making on Vito on that first approach. Are you hitting one or more of the areas that they're concerned about? Uh, are you putting them first? Are you acknowledging their, their uniform? Are you saluting their uniform? Are you not challenging their ego, power, control, and authority? Think about all that before you pick up the phone. I like that. You mentioned something earlier about board members being a laydown. Expand on that. So in your business experience, I'm sure you've been asked to sit on the board of a company. I've been asked, the boards I've sat on are, are, are really, I mean, it's a wonderful experience to to be involved in something like that. And as a board member, before the board meeting, I'd start to go crazy trying to find something to bring to the board meeting of value, something that, 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 I, that I could earn my keep, so to speak. Well, think about Vito's board. If you're selling to any company that has a board of directors and you, you haven't gotten a hold of Vito, if you get a hold of a board meeting, a, a board member, just think about this. You pick up the phone, you call, you, first of all, find out who's on Vito's board and almost guarantee you uh, if Vito's an existing customer or a prospect, you're going to see people on Vito's board that would probably be a good prospect for you. Okay, so if, you, if you're looking to, to, to put a killer list together for prospecting and you're calling on major corporations like I have over the years, look at the board members. So now let's just say, let's, let's just say uh, they're a prospect. You haven't called Vito. And um, you find a board member and say, you know what? I'm going to call that board member and ask them if they'd be interested in, now there's your value proposition. It would be the same value proposition that you have for Vito. Does it touch on any one of the four areas that we talked about? Um, to bring the idea to the next board meeting or to introduce you to Vito. So if I'm a board member and I'm getting ready to go to a board meeting, I'm like, yeah, what, what do you got? Tell me about it. Tell me, tell me what it is. And so... Board members are a great resource for us to contact to get to Vito. Now, in an existing account, it holds the same way. Let's say you've got this big account uh, and you've never met Vito because you're stuck down in Linoleumville because you said the stupid question to whoever you've been calling on, who besides yourself will be making the decision? Who besides yourself should I be talking to? Nobody. Stay with me right here in Linoleumville and everything will be fine. So we've given up our freedom of speech amendment right there. We flushed it down the toilet. And, and so now, with it, geez, how can I get the veto? Well, if they're a publicly held company, look at the board members, contact the board members, and say, you know what? We've been working in this company trying to prove our, our concept or doing whatever. Would you be willing to introduce me to veto? You'd be the, this, they're in, you hear about this all the time. Get an inside coach. Get an inside coach. You want a good inside coach? Get a board member to be your inside coach. So, so that's, that's the kind of thinking 
uh, it, when it comes to board members. Not, not every company has board members because every company isn't publicly held. But if they are, and you as a salesperson are calling on any company that's a publicly held company, do yourself a big favor and buy one share of stock in that company. Just one. What are you going to get in the mail? Everything. You're not going to have to look for anything. It's going to be mailed to you. There, there, there's, there, there are annual report, their interim reports, their managers, you get all of it. One share of stock. And when the, when you talk to Vita, you could tell them you're a shareholder. And they're not going to say how many shares you have, but if they do, you could say just one, but I watch it very closely, you know? <laughs> so, I love that. I love that. Then, yeah. would, would you would, would you give the same advice for, let's say, privately held companies that yes. have investors? Yes, most definitely. Now, but again... The first attempt I would make is to reach out to veto themselves. But if that f fails, for whatever reason, then start to look at the other tentacles, other ways to get other breadcrumbs to follow to veto's office. Um, if you're calling on an account and you're down on Linoleumville, you're going to have to take this up one step at a time up the food chain because you don't want to peeve anybody off. You don't want to destroy any relationships here. You don't want to get crazy about this. And so if you've had an existing account, you're down on Linoleumville, take it one step at a time, but do yourself a favor. Never, ever, ever take a step to talk to someone with the same language you've been talking to someone down on Linoleumville. Because when you do that, they'll say, just go talk to those guys and gals down there. You don't have time for this. So there's four languages in sales. Four. Just four. And we need to be proficient at each one. The first is benefits. Vito's talking benefits. That's it. That's all they understand. Benefits. The result of what it is that you sell. The result. Not what it is, but what it does. That's a benefit. The people that report to Vito, their trusted advisors, you know, the, the, the CFO, the CTO, the CIO, the CMO, lots of C titles, VPs, they talk the language of advantages, how you do it, how you tailor it, how you customize it, how you tweak it to do whatever it is that gives you the result. Okay, so Vito's talking benefits. The people that report directly to them talk in advantages. The people that report to Vito have a bunch of people working for them. And those are the people down in Linoleumville, right? The technologists, the programmers, the researchers. Those people talk the language of features. Those F-bombs, the acronyms and technobabble and all that kind of stuff. So now we've got Vito's talking and understanding benefits. They're trusted advisors talking and understanding advantages. And the technologists down in Linoleumville that report to these trusted advisors talking features. And then the people who are going to use whatever it is you sell, the worker bees in the company, they talk the language of functions. How do you use what you sell? It's like the user's manual, the owner's manual of whatever it is you sell. There's the four languages. So now when you look at this, just, just think about this for a moment. If <laughs> I, had a, I had a class in Spanish I took, you know, it was a submersion thing. I wanted to learn Spanish. And I, if you don't, if not able to speak Spanish at the end of the class, they'll give you your money back. So halfway through the halfway through the class, I went to order takeout, Mexican takeout, and I ordered it in Spanish. I get up to the window and they start handing me these white paper bags. I, I had like twenty five dollars worth of tacos, and I I was talking the wrong language to these people. They didn't understand. So it's the same thing with Vito: benefits, advantages, features, and functions, and don't mix it up. You can't mix it up. This is like the Italian salad dressing of sales training. Oil and vinegar. Shake it all you want. It looks like it's yeah. mixed up. You set it down for a microsecond. And what happens? The oil separates from the vinegar. You say one advantage to a veto. They're going to say, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. What does this thing do? If you say one benefit to a, someone down in Linoleumville, they'll say, stop trying to sell me and stick to the facts. 
This has happened right. to each and every one of us. So pay attention to that. Four languages, don't mix them up. Italian salad, vinegar and water. I love it. Don't mix them up. <laughs> That's too funny. Uh, when we look at, uh, I'm, I'm going to take you back now, Tony. I'm going to take you back, if you don't mind. And so back in the, I think, late 70s, probably late 70s, early 80s, a gentleman by the name of Mac Hannon came out with consultative selling, you know, which was the, uh, you know, it was almost like the de facto standard for, you know, selling from a consultative standpoint. Now, bringing it back to how selling has changed or has evolved, talk to me about, you know, how, you know, consultative selling really impacts how you approach a veto and then, you know, what's changed in that process 10 years ago versus today? How do we sell to veto differently? Do we still do consultative? I mean, what do we do? You know, there's a lot of good material out there. You've written nine books. I've written nine books that you can. There, there's there's a lot of different ways. But and, 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 and in those ways and modalities, Larry Wilson, uh, you name, you go back and name them. Good name. Time. It, 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 iconic, timeless, absolutely timeless work. Yeah. Does it work? Neil Rackham. Work? Neil Rackham would be one. Yeah, Neil Rackham. You, you name it. You name it. I mean, they're all great. I would say what has changed the most is the time we have to get the point across. The time has been compressed. We used to say an opening statement could be like 30 seconds, then it went to 15, now it's 10, then it's five. Actually, it's a nanosecond, man. If you don't make sense to somebody in the first two or three seconds, the conversation comes to a screeching halt. So what has changed in my mind, my experience, is the time we have and the education level of our products, services, and solutions and what they do and what they don't do that people have today. Our education, you know, um, information is, is all around us, but knowledge isn't. So how do you move from information to knowledge? If I'm selling to more than one industry, like let's just say I'm, I'm selling to discrete manufacturers, process manufacturers, retail, hospitality, education, I need to become more than anything an industry expert in those areas. Forget my product expertise. Industry, because if you have in, if you have your hand on the pulse in the industry you're selling to, then you're current, and and you can save time instead of asking Vito stupid questions that they should never be asked. You'll know the answers to those, and you can validate your understanding. So. Information's out there, knowledge is precious. And as a salesperson, I need to be knowledgeable on the industry and have some knowledge, not a lot of knowledge about Vito's company because we don't want to show up on Vito's doorstep telling them what we know about their company. They know everything about their company. They don't need to hear that. As a matter of fact, if I read a Vito's manager's report, the quarterly manager's report, the worst thing I could do is show up on their doorstep telling them that I've read that. And, and, and maybe if I could say something that proves to them I read it, and they'll say, hey, did you see that in my manager's report? Sure did. And so instead of showing up, trying to proclaim how smart we are, show up and prove it. So I think that's what's changed. But the, the Larry Wilson... Wilson stuff, the Neil Rackham stuff, the, the uh, Miller Hyman stuff, all that stuff still applies because it's people that we're dealing with. There's still people. But the time yeah. I, by the way, I agree. I agree. I think uh, a lot of, you know, the technologies and the tools we use are evolving, may have changed. Yes. But how we approach people, I, I, I say this today, and then I, I love your take on this, that all products are almost the same. Tony, all services are almost the same. Right. We've reached this point of parity. And so the salesperson, the ability to frame everything you've been talking about up to this point, the, the salesperson has become the differentiator. Yes. Yeah. And actually, always has been. You know, I think it was Zig, 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 Zig Ziglar that said, you know, first people buy you and then they buy what you have to offer them. And he's also said something like, you know, serve their best interest. And they will in turn serve yours. The law of reciprocity, right. the law of reciprocity, 
applies across the board. It applies to Vito's personal assistant. When you get Vito's personal assistant on the phone, forget that Vito exists. Picture Vito blasting off into this in, in, in a rocket up to outer space. They're gone. Even if they're standing right next to them, they're gone. So treat Vito's private assistant like they're Vito. Any questions you would ask of Vito, ask of the private assistant. If you have an opening statement for Vito, bounce it off the private assistant because they know what's going on. And if you salute their uniform, instead of saying, is Vito in or would you take a message? They don't work for me, they work for Vito. And so forget Vito exists, treat the personal assistant like their Vito, get equal business stature and they'll get you in or keep you out, it's so simple. So all the stuff we learned about how to get through, past, over, around, under, doesn't work, never has worked, yeah. Yeah, I agree with that. I agree. The the tricks of the trade don't work. I, I, I want to, I'm going to throw this one out there. So get ready for this. This is coming hard and fast, right? This is kind of a change up I'm throwing at you. The studies have shown that relationship selling is important, but business leaders, vetoes, want to see results first before they have want a relationship. Your thoughts? I think part of that's true. I think nothing holds true for everyone. Um, I, I think you have to feel it out and find out what's important to someone by listening to what they say and the reactions they have. So I, I love research like yourself. I'd like to look at this stuff. When I look at it, I go, OK, well, you know, I'll, I'll remember that, but I'm not going to fly my plane by that. You know, I got this. Right. <laughs> everything's in the book. Yeah. But when it comes right down to it, people who save the day respond on their instincts and, and show that response. And, and so. Um, yeah, there, there was a pilot and I went to his his uh, retirement party that was the pilot that flew the 747 SP 400 out of Honolulu on, a, on its way to New Zealand and the fuselage blew out of the first class section and uh, lost, lost passengers and crew and, 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 and uh, when the co-pilot reported to the pilot what happened, the pilot took out the, the went through everything, every checklist on a, a 747 SP 400, this huge airplane, nothing worked, nothing worked. He had to fly this plane by the seat of his pants. And when I went to his retirement party, they reenacted the flight, except for the disaster, got down to New Zealand. Um, how did you do it? How did he says, you know what? We always fly by the book, by the book, by the book. When the book doesn't work, you got to fly by the seat of your pants. And so knowledge and understanding of all these methodologies is important, but find out what's important to the person you're talking with. Like you have influenced this entire interview by taking me back. Wait a minute, Tony, you said this and you did it in a way that was complimenting me rather in a way that was dismissing me. Think of, watch, and, and I watched something, I, I watched a video of you and you said you like to listen to preachers or something. Uh, uh, and, 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 I do. and you learn, I do actually, you, yeah. you learn from, well, I'm, I'm a talk show freak. I love listening to talk shows and I love watching people interview other people. And when you show respect and you honor your guests, like you have been showing respect and honoring me, no matter what question you ask, you always brought it back to where you wanted it to go by influencing it and honoring it. And I think that's the real secret. If there's a book that needs to be written today, how do we honor and maybe you and I should write the book. How do we honor, how do we honor <laughs> our prospects in a way that builds a relationship and gets them what they need? Yeah, how do we do that? I love that. I love that. I, I you know, the, the, the big shift for me, and I'm, I, we're going to conclude this podcast here on this, I'll give you the last word, is the equal business stature of all things is the one I'm really taking away. The one I'm just tucking in my pocket going, I've never been able to explain that so easily and as soon as you said equal business stature versus equal business title you've just given me the answer and i thank you you've just given me the answer to every time i hear the question about imposter syndrome uh, by the way your story was great around that and i think that made it even more powerful tony uh first of all thank you very much uh where can they find out more information about you about your books especially selling devito getting devito the secrets of veto just understand veto it's it's totally so working to go man. you know I'm, I'm, of course if you want to read and a lot of people don't have time to read you can buy the book amazon's got the book uh, 
Uh, we have an audio book. We've given the audio book away. Matter of fact, if any of your people wanna, want to um, uh, get a copy of the audio book, we give it away these days. Um, but you know, if you just go to, to Vito uh, Selling or Vito Corporate Sales Training, you can find me on LinkedIn. You can find me online. If, I mean, most of the time, if you just type in Selling to Vito, you'll see all the different, like you found the Entrepreneur a Media Magazine uh, articles. Uh, but wow. I'm pretty easy to find. Um, I would invite salespeople to really um, not only develop their hard skills, like tactical stuff that I teach, but their soft skills, their listening skills, their questioning skills, um, and their presentation skills. All of this stuff is critically important to building that equal business stature. And on, on that note, on how to find me, um, <clears throat> Google me, LinkedIn, I'm on there. We have a veto group on LinkedIn. You're everywhere, man. Yeah. You're ev you're everywhere, man. You know, you know uh, the I want to emphasize the folks should re-listen to this, especially on the subtleties. Uh, you know, when you say the soft skills, I think you take soft skills to another level. When you say, you know, did you know versus no, no, no it's as we know. I consider that a soft skill, but that's like mastery level. And what you've done, and I'm not blowing smoke up your backside here. You're from the East Coast, so I can't do that. Not, not very the, well, anyway. One of the things I respect well. about you. Yeah, yeah. What, one, of, one of the things I respect about you and I admire is I'm like a real fan of samurai movies, right? Like old samurai movies, right? And they always talk about, you know, uh, these, 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 these masters who've, who've mastered one thing. You know, remember, they, they practiced that one kick 10,000 times. Remember Bruce Lee said, I'm afraid of the guy, not that practiced 10,000 kick one time. It's the guy that's practiced one kick 10,000 times. And you have, you've focused on this veto market, very important top officers, like the decision makers. And this has been like your career path. And if I guess I could just tag out one more question is like, why? Why, why are you so stubborn in a good way and focus so hard I'm an on Italian. just veto? I'm stubborn. <laughs> From New Jersey. I'm a Jersey boy. No, but, but here's, I have been tempted by so, Tony, would you teach a class on listening? No, nope, I teach a class on this. Would you do that? No, nope, I'm a one trick pony. To your point, I have focused like a laser beam, not like a wide flood floodlight, but I have a laser beam focus on the practical, tactical, proven, sustainable, repeatable process to get in front of veto. Now, once you get in front of veto, if you shoot yourself in the foot, reload and shoot yourself in the other foot, hey, I got you to veto, and so that's my specialty. Yeah, and you're right. I have focused that, and, and it's just the practice. Is, my family is like that. We're practical, we're tactical, we're focused, and uh, and I've been a one trick pony for a lot of years, and that's that's my giddy up. I love it, man. I love it. Anyway, on that note, this is Victor Antonio with the Sales Influence Podcast. Please leave me some feedback on iTunes, Stitcher, YouTube, Spotify, iHeartRadio. We're all over the place. So again, leave some feedback. After you do that, go to Tony's website, sellingdevito.com. Download his book. I'm telling you, the return on investment, and I said it, not ROI, the return on investment is going to be there. And especially if you're having difficulty with imposter syndrome, this book is for you. If you're trying to get... One of the things Tony mentioned, I'll just say this on the side, is that when you get to veto, you shorten the sales cycle. He said that like it was a throwaway line. I grabbed that as a big nugget because one of the things we have to do is shorten that sales cycle. So sellingdevito.com, and after you do that, you know the deal. Go to victorantonio.com, and on that note, this is Victor Antonio, always reminding you, selling ain't hard when you sell to veto, and you know how. Take care. Big Tin Can is the world's leading sales learning and enablement platform that delivers the onboarding and training, preparation, coaching, customer engagement, and follow-up and insights that modern businesses need to win. 